All right, um, I hear we've lost a bit of time, so we'll try to zip through ours so we can make up some of it. Um, so uh, I'm Vinod, um, how do I introduce myself? I've uh, co-founded Hadoop Yarn back when I was in Yahoo. Um, I'm still running the same team at Hotworks, uh, also PMC at Apache. Um, I have Sid with me who's working with us, uh, um, you know, getting many efforts in uh, Hadoop Yarn. So today we'll, again, we have a very short time. You know, 30 minutes is too short a bit of time to you can carry on. We are running late. So yeah. We'll no, that's fine. This is my. This is flexible. Yeah. That, that's, that's okay. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it's a uh, short uh, short enough time to actually cover through a lot of topics. So I'll probably spend five minutes, uh, you know, listing a bunch of uh, mega efforts that are happening in Yarn, uh, and then Sid will uh, walk us through uh, a specific topic uh, about running, you know, Docker apps uh, and how we get they can get integrated inside Yarn, right? Um, a very quick show, so I'm assuming a lot of people here know about Yarn. Anybody who does not know Yarn, let me do the reverse show. <laughs> okay, a couple of those. Uh, a short time summary, Yarn is a cluster management solution which we have originally uh, evolved as a general purpose system to run MapReduce and you know, beyond that we've now, uh, you know, from the design we've evolved the Hadoop MapReduce system into a more general purpose computing system where you can run different distributed applications. Uh, so now we run MapReduce, the next version of MapReduce, you know, Thes, Spark, and a whole bunch of uh, new apps you can run on top of this resource management system, right? Um, I'll just summarize that again. Like I said, there's no way I can uh, talk about Yarn in a, a short ses session. Um, to give a quick overview of what's happening now and what, what's cooking up in Yarn, uh, there are a bunch of releases. Uh, of course, uh, Yarn is part of uh, the bigger Hadoop project itself, so our releases are tied to uh, Apache Hadoop re uh, releases too. Um, so there are a bunch of releases around 2.6 and 2.7, lots of stabilization. Uh, 2.8 has been, uh, you know, oncoming for a lot of time. Uh, in terms of mega features that are happening right now, uh, uh, I, I'd like to call out a few. Uh, the first one is what we call as timeline service V2. Uh, we've actually lacked uh, what I call as, you know, uh, a diagnosis system for Hadoop clusters. Today, if you want to know you know, how is my cluster performing? How are my jobs performing? It, it's more of a black art. Uh, you know, only a few people in, in the world actually can, uh, can do it. Um, so we're building a system uh, which can essentially replace them, help administrators and help users to figure out how, how their cluster is performing, how is it getting utilized, do I need to do something to improve the situation of either my cluster, my hardware, or, or my applications. Um, that's been a work in progress. The other interesting piece of work that's happening is a bunch of uh, folks at Microsoft, uh, they're working on a federation feature for Yarn. By design, we've uh, tried to run, scale Yarn up to uh, about 10,000 nodes. Uh, you know, uh, off the shelf, you kind of know the clusters running 12,000, 13,000 nodes. Uh, the goal here is to run really massive uh, clusters, uh, even to size of 100,000 nodes, right? Uh, that's a mega feature that's been, uh, 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 you know, in progress for a while. Um, the other important one that we're working on is again, uh, as I described, a whole bunch of different types of applications run in a Hadoop Yarn cluster. So it actually is, very, is a difficult task to configure the cluster in such a way it, it is optimally used by all the applications. One of the most common issues that we see in, in, in any production cluster that we've seen is uh, users tend to be overly conservative. They plan for the peaks for their applications and they, you know, as part of that, they, they tend to underutilize uh, resources, right? Uh, clearly, they get more predictability by being very conservative, but as a cluster administrator, you're, you're not happy uh, out of the you know, performance you're getting out of the cluster, right? Um, so the whole subscription feature is essentially, you know, it's, it's trying to pack more and more containers on individual boxes, so you get you get more out of it. Of course, it has implications on how uh, users see, see the picture. Uh, in addition to that, we are working on a whole bunch of SLA-related features, so we get we give better predictability to applications. Um, in, in the future work section, uh, we are working on a new web UI. You know, Yarn web UI was uh, built in 2011, so it has kind of aged. Um, in addition to that, we also are slowly starting uh, a renewed effort at running services. In addition to uh, running MapReduce, Spark kind of applications, which are focused, you know, on running something for a little while and then uh, terminating, we are focusing on running long running applications on top of Yarn. You know, Yarn is, as an architecture was always, always built for uh, running this, but there are a bunch of you know, superficial uh, uh, things that we, we could not get right. So this is a, uh, this is our second attempt at it. 
in addition to that, you know, over time, in the beginning, uh, like I was saying, Jan was built for running MapReduce, so the notion of data locality uh, was always a fundamental concept uh, in Yarn, in addition to things like fault tolerance, security, etc. Um, over time, we also realized, you know, more and more applications need, you know, uh, more co complex placement strategies, if you will. Uh, in addition to saying, just run my code near data, they also have requirements like run on this rack, you know, but don't run very close to that other application, you know, things like that, right? So we're trying to generalize them and build all these features in a generic fashion. So uh, you have a perfect, you know, you have a powerful model to uh, give these, specify these requests to the platform. Um, that's, that's mostly future. Uh, there's also the Docker runtime, which is the focus of the uh, next conversation. So off to sit. Yeah, folks, uh, switch to the next slide. One more. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'd like to do a little bit of context setting before we dive into some of the technical details of what the Docker container runtime is and uh, why we went about building it in here. So. Uh, how many folks here have heard of the Linux container executor in YAN? Are you familiar with it at all? Okay, so that's a very small fraction. And how many of you have heard of Docker? Oh, sorry, I'm excited that. <laughs> okay, uh, so YAM and Hadoop have the notion of executors, which basically, uh, depending on the platform you are running on, uh, let you specialize how you launch and manage your application process, right? So. Uh, in Windows, you have the Windows Secure Executor, and then there's a default executor that sort of runs on uh, across platforms, and then there's a Linux executor, which basically uh, lets you uh, run applications on top of Linux. Linux Container Executor also implements all the uh, Hadoop, Kerberos yeah. based uh, Hadoop security models uh, on uh, YAM. So uh, that's the background with respect to what Linux container executor is. And Docker, it already looks like most of you know what it is. It's basically a container packaging and runtime uh, mechanism. So to set a little bit of context on why we integrated uh, Docker with YAN. So we know already talked about uh, some of the new things that we're doing in YAN and Hadoop. So um, there are a couple of different uh, key areas there. One of them is uh, long-lived services on YAN. So we are seeing more and more people wanting to run more and more kinds of applications on top of uh, cluster managers, so to speak, right? We have seen people wanting to run everything from Hedgebase to Kafka, and in some cases, Storm and things like that. And uh, that's one class of things. And the uh, other thing is that we also want to be able to do better at data itself, right? So there are cases where people want to be able to run, uh, say Spark is one good example, right? The, Jan already runs a bunch of uh, other engines, Hive, MR, uh, Taze, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the rate at which some of these uh, engines evolve, it is very difficult for your cluster administrators to install all of them and make sure that they're all tested and all those kinds of things, right? So what Docker lets us do is it basically lets us uh, install different versions of these engines and so that different users can run different kinds of applications without stepping on each other. So uh, we'll see a demo related to that uh, later in the presentation. So that's the broader context as to why we decided to integrate Docker with you. All right, uh, so the notion of container runtimes. So the, when we first integrated Docker with YAM, they, they actually ended up creating what is known as the Docker container executor. So again, it was parallel to Windows, Linux, and default. Now, the one of the key drawbacks of that was that it required all your applications on the cluster to run inside Docker containers. Now, for real users and real cluster administrators, that's obviously a non-starter, because if you already have a 100 or a 1,000 node cluster, you wouldn't you know, want to run your existing high or MI workloads uh, inside Docker containers, right? So we sort of had to bring in new abstractions to enable you know, existing clusters just by upgrading them without, you know, uh, killing your current workload. So which is why we introduce the notion of uh, container runtimes. Now, what container runtimes do is they're a lower level abstraction than executors themselves. So within uh, Linux and Linux container executor, for example, you can basically run, use different container runtimes. You can use Docker, and the current process-based mechanism is moved into its own runtime. 
and you can add uh, new ones later. You can use rocket or any of these other mechanics. I mean, if somebody is brave enough, they could even try VMs. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. So it basically lets us integrate with all of these packaging and isolation mechanisms without, uh, at the same time, supporting all your existing workloads. Now we added this as part of uh, Yarn 3611. That's the Jira that's uh, mentioned up there. Right now, our focus is on only on the Docker container runtime, but uh, in the future, we could do uh, more things with it. All right. Uh, in terms of uh, the requirements on Docker itself, uh, we basically need the Docker 1.10 to be able to use some of the features that have already been implemented and some of the new ones that are being planned, like user namespaces and things like that. Uh, in addition to that, you sort of need a uh, recent Linux kernel because a bunch of uh, C groups and related features don't necessarily work otherwise. So if you are uh, running, say, uh, CentOS 6, this is basically a non-starter. So you need something like RHEL 7 or CentOS 7 to get started. Um, so then let's dive into some of the specific uh, features that the runtime supports. Right Now, resource isolation. So Linux Container Executor already supports uh, C groups today. Uh, so you can basically ensure that your CPU, memory uh, are capped to whatever values you specify. We also added support for disk and network. So there's outbound bandwidth. Uh, you can do pair sharing across that. In a similar way, if you're using the CFQ scheduler for disk, you can make sure that your disk bandwidth is also you fairly shared across containers. Right? Now, we wanted to make sure that all of this work that we have done in Yarn uh, integrates well with this new runtime. So Docker has the notion of a C group parent. So what you can do is you can create your own C groups and then ask Docker to attach to those C groups. So all the traffic shaping and isolation and all of these that Yarn does automatically works because this uh, container, all the container processes are uh, basically uh, running in a child of that C group. Uh, capabilities. So Linux has the notion of uh, capabilities for process. So what you can do is you can basically specify what kind of, uh, what class of operations a specific process is allowed to do. So there are things like uh, cap underscore set UID, which basically lets you run set UID binaries. And there are, uh, I think there's there are a bunch of other examples that we'll uh, sort of uh, look at later. Now, all of these capabilities aren't created equal. So there's one cap sysadmin capability, for example, which is sort of a broad bucket of capabilities. It's just classified as one thing. So you sort of have to be careful as to what you will let your processes do inside these containers. So we added support for controlling these capabilities. So the default set of capabilities that we add is based on what Docker already does. Uh, but cluster admins can go in and you know make this an even more restrictive set if they so please. Uh, privileged containers. So we have run into some interesting scenarios where uh, it was required that uh, we launch what are known as privileged containers. Now in addition to capabilities, there are certain operations that privileged uh, containers are able to do. Uh, for some reason that I'd rather not go into right now, we try to run Oracle inside one of these containers, the existing Oracle installation. Now, uh, what ended up happening was uh, Oracle assumes that it owns the entire box and it can make whatever changes it wants on that node, right? So it tries to use sysctl to make a bunch of uh, settings changes and tries to get away with it. Now, if you want to be able to containerize that, you sort of uh, have to escalate some of the privileges that that container has. So we support the notion of uh, privileged containers as well. Now the trouble here is that we don't want to let uh, every user of the cluster have access to this. So it's an admin controlled ACL list. Uh, it's disabled by default, you have to enable it. You have to be in that list and then explicitly request it. So if you do all of these three things, you will be able to launch uh, privileged containers. Uh, in terms of users itself, so uh, the Docker daemon basically is an uh, privileged process. So it uh, lets you switch users for the containers that you launch as, right? So this again fits in nicely with the uh, Linux container executor and the security model that already exists in Hadoop. So when you're submitting an application, you sort of have to ensure that the application process runs as uh, the user who has the right set of uh, you know credentials and privileges. So 
what we do is based on the user that uh, Hadoop has been asked to run the app as, uh, we just pass that user on to uh, Docker run and it ensures that the user is running as the right user. Now again, you sort of have to be careful here about wh what capabilities your users have, what your containers have, right? So you could start a container as nobody, but if you have the set UID capability, you can basically acquire the root privileges, uh, do all kinds of things that you don't want people to be doing. Uh, networking. So this is where things get a little interesting. Now, in the YARN and Hadoop world, uh, many of the existing applications sort of assume that their tasks and workers uh, coexist with the node manager on the same node. Uh, MR is one example, I think Spark is another. So what we had to do was to enable all of these applications, we had to use uh, Docker's net equal to host mode. So what it does is uh, it runs the container process uh, isolated, uh, CH2 and all of that, but it makes sure that the host network stack is uh, shared with the container network stack. Now, the, again, there are security implications here. Uh, I've heard of cases where people with container, using containers that are uh, have net equal to host, they're able to reboot the node outside. So, sort of have to be uh, careful again when using this. Uh, because we want to let existing engines run the way they do already on YAN, this is currently the default, but it will likely be uh, switched in the near future. Now, with uh, Docker 1.9, there's a bunch of uh, networking plugins and related support that was added. So what you can actually do is uh, uh, you can use the minus minus net <coughs> argument when launching a container and specify which plugin is used. Now these plugins can do a whole variety of interesting things. They could create a private uh, SDN, a software defined network, so that these containers can talk to each other, but they can't see the outside world or the outside world can't see them. Right? That's one aspect of it. Or you can make sure that these containers have uh, IP addresses that are in the same flat address space as the nodes themselves. So now you essentially have these containers and the process and the services running in them fully addressable in your corporate network. So all of these interesting things are uh, possible if you use those networking plugins. Now, by default, uh, we already support this today. Uh, you can set an environment variable and what kind of uh, network you want to use, but there's no validation and there's no control to ensure that only a limited set of these plugins are, uh, the allowed plugins can be used by specific users, right? So we are doing some work, that's the Gina that's mentioned there, YAM 4007, where uh, we'll basically add some, do some additional work to uh, streamline this a little bit. Images. Uh, so. The, uh, this is another interesting area where there's a bunch of work that's uh, going on. Uh, not a whole lot of this is in the community yet. So uh, when we're trying to distribute images at scale, uh, there are basically two different classes of approaches that you, you could take. One of them is using the Docker registry itself, which is basically let the, uh, the registry, either a private one or a Docker Hub or any of these, uh, do image management for you. Basically do downloads and things like that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, most of these Hadoop clusters, if not all of them, are already running HDFS and they have a way to distribute data already. So one approach we could take is uh, basically upload, uh, uh, Docker lets you save images as uh, tarballs, so you could upload them to HDFS and localize in the usual manner that happens today and then load those images. But there are, again, security implications there because uh, the image I load uh, make clobber uh, your image if they have the same name and things like that. So we sort of have to find a way to cleanly namespace this in some way. And of course you could also use uh, uh, private registries. Uh, the advantage there is that uh, you sort of uh, don't have to worry about Docker's evolving API. They keep changing things very frequently so uh, the registry API that works today may not work tomorrow. So that could be one good reason to uh, use that and all the optimizations they make in terms of layers to make sure that layers are not re-downloaded across images and things like that. Uh, you get all of those which are not possible with the uh, HDFS approach because in HDFS once you have archived the image, if two different images share uh, layers, say they both have the base CentOS 6 image, you can't, you'll end up re-downloading them even if they are already, uh, those images are already on the host. So, like I said, work in progress. There's a bunch of uh, interesting things coming here as well. All right, so we'll take a 
we'll spend a few minutes on a couple of quick demos. Uh, so the first one we'll do here is uh, Spark on Docker. This is sort of the canonical demo here because this is basically one of the key use cases we are going for here, which is you have an existing uh, YARN cluster, you have a running uh, HDFS instance, you basically have, you want to bring your own uh, Spark world to this, right? different versions of Spark, different ML libs, different dependencies, different versions of Python, and so on and so forth. It's very difficult to do that if all of the software is not packaged and isolated in some way. So Docker lets us do that uh, cleanly, so uh, we'll see a demo as to how this is possible. I'm just the mic boy here. <laughs> All right. Um, Can you guys see from the back of the room? I can change the font size a little bit. OK, uh, so this is basically a single node cluster here, running name node, data node, the usual Hadoop processes. And if you come here, you can see that there's basically one node. So what we'll do is we'll, first of all, run a couple of client containers so that uh, uh, we can run smart uh, Spark submit from there. Right. So before we do that, So what we are basically doing here is that we are using the 1.4.1 image. You can bring your own image. And asking Yarn to use the Docker container runtime and use uh, this image when actually using uh, Spark Submit. Uh, we are mounting the clusters Hadoop config directory into etc Hadoop conf as read-only and then uh, setting that as an environment variable as well. Uh, okay. And, and similarly, we'll do one point five. I can see that there are basically these two client containers running here. Now, what we'll do is we'll simultaneously submit. Actually, we'll take a look at that script as well. So this launch in one point four point looks no different. You're basically doing a Spark submit. You're running a uh, Pi job, and you're specifying that you need 512 megs of RAM and one executor core. So, and, okay, we'll start both of these. And as these apps move into the running state, we should spin up containers. So you can see that there was one container that came up and went. And there's another container that came up for, you can see that the name here is basically Yarn's container name, but it's running in a Docker container. We are doing a watch in Docker PS. So 141, 152, mixing and matching Spark versions, they are running in their own containers completely isolated. And that should be it. So the job's basically finished. I'm not going to show you what the value of pi is. Uh, so that was the first demo. Now we'll also do a s slightly different demo here. So one of the use cases that we have uh, had internally, and it's also an uh, interesting use case for uh, other folks who are running large clusters, right? So you might already be running a large YARN cluster, uh, again have HDFS on it. You might want to try some interesting new features or test a release before you actually push it out, right? So in this demo, what we'll show is you know, using the isolation features provided by Yarn, you can actually run Yarn itself on top of Yarn. I call it the inception. So I'm going to use uh, a distributed shell here, uh, but uh, since it's a single node, if you're actually going to use, uh, uh, say, a multi-node cluster here, it's probably better to use something like Slider, so you can specify multiple components, masters, slaves, and so on and so forth. Uh, Take a look here. We're basically using YAN jars and again setting the environment variables that specify the runtime. And we're starting the bootstrap script 
uh, inside the container which will basically start up all the process. So, So you basically see that we're using the sequence IQs Hadoop Docker image. It exposes a bunch of ports that basically correspond to standard Hadoop ports. Uh, so what we can do is oops. So this is the sort of ugly container executor launch and then even a bigger docker launch. So this is basically the expansive docker run command that's used and all the features, all the config logs are translated into this. So you can see that the user that's being run here is nobody and you can see all the capabilities that are being added to the container. Uh, let's see, you can also see the C group parent that specifies that Jan already created this C group and attached to it and you can see the launch container script, which is the way the process is usually launched today. Um, the other thing we can do is we can basically take this container name and get into it. And you can see here that this is, this is a different set of uh, loop processes. So that was inside the container and this is outside. Now, we're not using net equal to host here, uh, so what we can do is, actually let's get back into the container. So the Docker assigns a private IP here if you use the default uh, mode of networking, but if you have the right network plugin and the SDN infrastructure in place, it could be a fully externally accessible IP address. So what I'll do instead is I'll just tunnel here and then this is the cluster that's outside. You can see all the apps, uh, two Spark and one distributed shell, and the tunnel app. Oops. Nine, nine, six, right, so this is a separate Yarn instance and resource manager, you can see that there's basically no applications running here. Right? It's a single node. And the uh, name that you see here is basically whatever Docker assigns as the host name for that. Okay. So that's basically it from a demo perspective. Uh, resting the question, maybe one or two quick ones, uh, then we'll move on to the next presentation. If you have something, kind of a discussion type, then we'll request you to hold up till the end of the uh, session. Yeah. So, um, uh, when you're submitting the uh, Spark jobs to the container, so you have submitting two versions, 1.4 and 1.5. Yeah. So that's the assembly Spark assembly We'll repeat it. Yeah. Then spark assembly. So how you are submitting the Spark assembly? Because I do see the Spark assembly. You are submitting spark the assembly. Uh, to be honest, I know very little about Spark, so I'm not sure <laughs> what exactly yes, the question you're asking. Is. So his question was, uh, when I'm basically submitting those two uh, uh, Spark applications, where the Spark assembly that? Yeah, the Spark uh, assembly is existing in the cluster. It used to because if you have a Interacting with the multiple nodes, Spark assembly has to. I see. Uh, so we should probably take this offline. So the way it works here is that uh, the images that contain all the Spark bits are already localized. So the client container uh, that we launched here, that image okay. is actually the same as the image that's used on the server side to run the worker okay. in this demo. So all the bits are in both the places. Okay. So when we launched the client container and then we did a Spark submit from there, uh, you basically went to those nodes and the image was already there and basically launched the container in there. And we, it, I think it's using Yarn's uh, uh, Spark's Yarn cluster mode, so it's able to communicate back and forth. Does that answer your question? All right, thanks folks. Okay, if we 
don't have any more questions. Thank you. So the next presentation um, uh, shortly coming up is from um, uh, Andy Feng, Junshi, and uh, Mridul Jain from uh, Yahoo. Yeah.